So welcome everyone. Tonight's evening prayer is going to be focused upon St Hildegard of Bingen, very much a woman of her time and also in sympathy with our own time, being a gifted, theologically educated and forthright woman of prayer and spirituality who was profoundly in harmony with the created order. It will also center upon an icon which was painted of St Hildegard and which now graces a small oratory at the Margaret Beaufort Institute, along with a small bespoke calligraphic sign. The icon and sign were commissioned through the generous donations of the Margaret Beaufort Association in memory of our alumna, Anne Taylor, who tragically died last year. This evening, we remember Anne, along with other members of our alumni who have died through readings, prayer, meditation, and a presentation by Sister Esther of Tervy Abbey, who painted the icon of St Hildegard. So let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Next slide. And now we have a reading from Ecclesiasticus from a former principal of the Margaret Beaufort Institute, Dr. Una O'Brien. Next slide. Next. Here are some more of my reflections. Yes, I am as full as the moon at the full. Listen to me, devout children, and blossom like the rose that grows on the bank of the watercourse. Give off a sweet smell like incense, flower like the lily, spread your fragrances abroad, sing a song of praise, blessing the Lord for all his works. Declare the greatness of his name, proclaim his praise with song and with lyre, and this is how you must sing his praises. How wonderful the actions of the Lord. And now we have a reading from the writings of St. Hildegard by Sharon Lowe. I am the supreme and fiery force who kindled every living spark. Mine is the blast of the resounding word through which all creation came to be. I am life, whole and undivided, not hewn from any stone. All that lives has its root in me. I flame above, above the beauty of the fields to signify earth, the matter from which God made us. I shine in the waters to indicate the soul. For as water suffuses the whole earth, so does the soul pervade the whole body. I burn in the sun and the moon to denote reason, and the stars are the innumerable words of reason. Hope is not deceptive because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. We pray for our alumni, friends and supporters who have died over the past 18 months, and most especially for Anne Taylor, Antoinette Askin and Susanna Roberts. And together we pray, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Now, Mary, Mary um, Kelly Gross is going to take us through the sequence of the Holy Spirit, um, which is another wonderful writing by St. Hildegard. O oh, fire of the Spirit, the Comforter, life of the life of all creation, holy are you, giving life to the forms. Holy are you, anointing the mortally broken. Holy are you, cleansing the fettered wounds. 
O breath of sanctity, O fire of charity, O sweet savour in the breast, and balm flooding hearts with the fragrance of virtues. O limpid fountain, in which we can see how God gathers the strays and seeks out the lost. O breastplate of life and hope of the integral body. O sword belt of honour, save the blessed. Guard those the foe holds imprisoned. Free those in fetters whom divine force wishes to save. O current of power, permeating all in the heights, upon the earth and in all deep, you bind and gather all people together. From you clouds overflow. Winds take wing, stones store up moisture, waters well forth in streams and earth swells with living green. When by his word God fashioned the cosmos, founded sky and earth and sea. You, spirit, brooded over the waters, unfolded your deity. You make waters fruitful to give life to creatures. You breathe on men to make mortals living spirits. You are ever teaching the learned, made joyful by the breath of wisdom. Praise then, be yours. You are the song of praise, the delight of life, a hope and a potent honour, granting garlands of light. And now we're going to be um, taken through a meditation on the icon that was painted um, on behalf of the Margaret Bayford Association in memory of Anne Taylor. And to guide us is Mother Joanna Burton. There are many ways to look at St Hildegard. Poet, mystic, musician, spiritual guide, plant developer, feminist, climate activist even, feminist before her time. But I'd like to look at her and her life as that of a person who did not fit the offered stereotypes. She was a nun, but also all these other things a mystic yet seemingly intensely active, a woman yet wielding an authority rarely experienced perhaps in the church and an authority which in spite of battles with the local bishop seems to have been acknowledged by those in the church. And look at her in Sister Esther's icon, no thin tranquil ascetic but a buxom, almost fleshly figure with great strong legs and thighs, bristling with an energy it makes us think that she is about to jump down out of the icon and do what she has heard, obedient to the word of God as befits a daughter of St. Benedict, but certainly no stereotypical iconic ascetic figure. So she can teach us to be ourselves in the church and to encourage each other to be so too, to use the whole of ourselves for ministry and for others, not to accept to be less than we are, not to cut off great areas of our being and gifts, simply because the established authority says we must choose to be one or the other. And that, by extension, the church can be other than it currently is, more relational, more person-centred, reflecting more faithfully its Trinitarian model. No bad thought as the Institute inaugurates its Centre for Ecclesial Ethics. The second thing I notice is the blue circle of light with its three Trinitarian rays of light touching, penetrating St Hildegard. Here surely is the source of her freedom and of her discernment. As Orthodox Metropolitan John Zizoulis says in his book Being and Communion, the being of God is a relational being. God is eternally and forever going out of God's self to the other, firstly within the Trinitarian relationship and then with us and all his creation, wanting to draw us into ever fuller life through relationship. This relationship creates us. And here in the icon, we catch a glimpse of the particularity of relationship between God and St Hildegard. Look at her face. Not always easy for God, perhaps. Again, she is herself all there. No plaster statue, no expected stereotype. We can, must, each be with God as we are. Naked exposure in love. In the church, too, persons and relationships must always 
B primary, Christian structures should attempt to reflect the love and care that God has for us, the priority of persons. So this is an image of intimacy. Hildegard at prayer. See the inner room imaged in the house shape with its roof. Listening to God, receiving God's light, love and wisdom to enable her to discern what and how to act in her outward life. St. Julian of Norwich will say in her showings, God wants and expects our prayer, for with it, his grace, it makes us like to himself in our condition, as we are in nature. Pray wholeheartedly then, though it seems to you that there's no savour in it for you, for it is profitable, even though you feel it not. Pray wholeheartedly then, though you feel nothing, yes, though you feel you cannot for, for in dryness and in barrenness, in sickness and in weakness, then is your prayer most pleasing to me. Though you think it may almost taste this to you, it is living prayer in my sight. St Hildegard not only listens, but writes down for herself and for us what she hears. Again, what she writes is unique and non-stereotypical, not a scripture or patristic citation, if nonetheless wholly evangelical. May you be held by God. Perhaps this may be understood in two ways. Held by God through our relationship with him, our prayer, through which God creates and transforms us into his image and likeness, holding us far from those things that will harm us, giving us the wisdom to act as he would, what Father Jean-Pierre de Corsard calls the instinct of faith and inner knowledge of how to please God. It also, the glorious act, fact of being held by him, safe and secure, that may not feel like that to our senses, faith knows it is thus. St Hildegard, pray to God for us. Thank you. And now um, we have a presentation that um, Sister Esther pre-recorded, which um, tells us something about the actual making of that icon, following on from Mother Joanna's meditation. So hello everyone, this is nice to be able to share with you something of St. Hildegard, the icon. You, I presume you all know the story of St. Hildegard, so I won't uh, repeat that. But that she had to, um, obviously, I suspect from the childhood actually, locutions, she was able to hear things from the Lord. And then he, get, he told her to write these things down, or she gave it also to her secretary to write it down as well. So here we see the opening of the heavens in this one. That happens in some icons, like St George, for example, where you see the heavens opening. Here you actually have a hand, the hand of Christ, to give him strength to slay the dragon. And so here we have an opening, but no hand, of course, and these little rays to show the Holy Spirit also coming down on Hildegard as she writes. And this is part of some of the things that she has written. May I be upheld by God. And it shows that this is taking part, something, she reminds me a bit of um, Julian Norwich. So I've put her in her cell and we're looking into her cell. And here we can see her table that she's writing, sanding the book right to write in. And she was also very musical, so put a kind of zither or harp, whatever you like to call it, here. And um, she had many, many gifts, of course, as you all know. So, as regards her habit, um, it's a very medieval looking style, which was kept, of course, among people until um, the last century. And um, she's wearing what we call a gamp around her head and a veil, and I put, not black because it looked too dark, so I made it a sort of darky, darky uh, kind of black, but I did the light colours 
for the folds. And she's seated down on, on a seat. And here is the background of her sound, just the plain background, which was done with another technique. So I thought I'd show you how it's done. So we have egg yolk mix, which is the form of egg tempera and needed for it. And this is made from pure egg yolk with the skin off and half the amount of water to the egg yolk. And we put the mixture, mix it up, and I put a little bit of um, alcohol in to preserve it. Usually it can be vinegar, it can be a bit of beer, and um, but I happen to have an old alcohol, so I thought I'd use that up for this. And then to mix the colour, put in the same amount of egg yolk mix. Let's see if it's better over, better over this side, I think. And this, with that egg yolk mix, which is half water, add it to the egg yolk. And to make this basic colour, I used red with the blue, but, um, copper blue, to get it to that colour. Then the same amount of water. So I put three little drops of water of um, egg yolk. One, two, three. So these are three drops of the water. And this is the gesso board. I don't want to paint on it because it's to be for another icon. And it's done with a kind of plaster, but not fast as we know it, very refined chalk and there's various recipes in which to do that uh, to which you mix it with um, either gelatine glue or rabbit skin glue um, or some other kind of glue possibly and you build up the layers little by little by little and then once you have enough layers but it depends how thick how thin it is six to twelve layers and it's finally sanded down and then with a very smooth sander, just gently at the very end, so that when you put your finger on, it feels a bit like ivory. So then that's ready. That takes a little while to do. So when that's ready, it's ready to be painted on. I don't want to paint on that. But this just shows you a little bit how the basic colour for her habit was done. I didn't want to make it actually black. That's still a bit light, so I'm going to just make it a bit darker. That will be habit. Once that's on and dried, then I'll put in the folds and the, the folds and the light. So I enhance it a bit by using blue, it's an imagination really. But it's just to make one look at Hildegard. And on the back here, I haven't used water. What I've done, I've put just this with some yellow, the yellow mixture, and then I wipe the brush, no water, until my brush is quite dry, and then Is another technique, maybe just put these little faucets in or over, after this, leaving a few white spots here and there. And then, once that's dried, added white to this mixture and then put the other little faucets just here and there over it so you get this nice varied background. In fact, that's another way of actually painting, but um, it takes it takes longer. And here we see, like in all saints, Hildegard has a halo, and she wasn't made a saint until comparatively recent, recently. I think in the last century, sometime. I could be wrong, but I'm not, I'm not sure of dates. Though she lived, of course, many centuries before. 
But she reminds me an awful lot of St Julian of Norwich because she could hear these voices and she also had a, a secretary who painted the visions that she saw, more or less. And um, also, she reminds me also a little bit of um, a Greek Orthodox, not a sister, a married person, has two sons, um, who lives in Greece, I think, and she spent a lot of time in Egypt. And um, maybe you might have heard of her, Fasula Ryan, and she also received these um, locutions, as it were, from the Lord, they are genuine, and she writes, she writes them down as he speaks to her. It's stopped a little bit now, but it occurred an awful lot, I think, in the 1960s, 70s, around about that time. And um, her messages are still very relevant today. A little bit like Medjugorje, you know, to repent and to seek the Lord, basically. Um, and uh, she has felt a great need for Christian unity, even before it became more acceptable as it is today. And um, she's done a lot towards that, and this is her basis. And the messages she has received from Christ are towards the unity of his church or churches to form one body, one love in Christ. So that's the basic of St. Hildegard. The rest you probably know more than I do about it. But I wanted to share a little bit with you because I know you're having a special Zoom on this. Hildegard's face, by the way, um, all faces on icons have, are painted. Let me show you one example. Of Our Lady of the Mother of God, as she's called. This one where her face is with this brown in colour and then you have the highlights always coming down in this manner. Her face is down there, around by the chin, just under the part of the lip there, under the nose there, and the nose and just above where the eyebrows are. And underneath you've got, well, you can see all my eyes, what looks like a bit of tired eyes, I suppose, where the shades of the eyes are. Here in this particular one, we see Christ. Mother God is holding Christ. And she's always pointing towards Christ, never towards herself. And she has Christ on her arm, and Christ is blessing with his hand. And she has three crosses. One there, one there, and one on the other shoulder that way, but Christ, of course, is in front of that. But they're decorated, so they look like stars to show that she was a virgin before, during, and after birth. And I could go more and more about icons because it's such a useful lot to learn from them. But icons are done so in a very stylistic manner, and I think this is what gives them a lasting value. So when we paint saints, when we paint um, the Mother of God or Christ, we are not painting a portrait, we are painting an inner image of the person, but we have to show it on the outward aspect, which has developed over the centuries into this stylistic form, which takes some people some time to get used to if they're brought up in a Western church. Um, and icons, of course, are venerated not worship, they are venerated. So if you go to an Orthodox church, you will see people going around kissing the icons, lighting candles. They're not worshipping them, they're venerating them because they are something holy. Like when the priest holds the Gospel book in Mass or in the liturgy to Orthodox liturgy, um, it's a matter of veneration, not of worshipping the Things. There was once upon a time I read about two evangelical people who went into a convent, Orthodox convent, and they were being shown around the chapel and they were muttering to one another and uh, saying, because the sister who was showing them was bowing down and venerating the icons and kissing some. And he said, oh, you know, a pagan worship. And um, the superior happened to say to them, 
well, should we kiss the Bible? Because that is the word of God, isn't it? And they said, oh, yes, we wouldn't hesitate not to do that if that was needed, required. So, oh, then, how funny to kiss paper and paint. And um, then they sort of realised what the real icon was representing. So that just gives a little short introduction to Hildegard. The rest of the colours were just brought about occasionally. I personally like the um, Novgorod icons, North Russia icons from the 14th century, and they have a lot of red and green in their icons. Rather like St George, he's from that period too. Red is often shown in the background, and lots of green, um, very contrasting colours, but very vibrant colours. The advantage of doing the painting in this method, on this gesso plastered wall, is that the paint doesn't disintegrate. It can last not forever, but certainly for many, many centuries. That's why at the beginning of the last century, they were able to started to restore icons when we knew more about how to restore tempera paint, red tempera paint, and they were amazed at the colours that were underneath. So nowadays we paint with the beauty of colour too. So that just gives a little introduction to the painting of St Hildegard. As regards her, as I said, you probably know much more than I do about the saint. So. It's been nice to share that with you. Thank you.